Hello and welcome. This is everything you need to know for week 13 fantasy football. We'll highlight everything we saw in week 12 and what it means going forward. Rams go into Arizona and roll easily. I thought there were two big stories. First, Kyron Williams. You know, we talked on Sunday. If Kyron got his roll back, it was a smash. And yes, Kyron got his roll back. Running back opportunities in the first three quarters yesterday. Kyron in his first game since week six, 22. Royce Freeman, 10. Zach Evans, zero. Not only did Kyron get 22 opportunities in the first three quarters, he was outrageously efficient. Dude dropped 40 plus DraftKings points. I think this is sticky, Evan. Like they keep saying they want to back off him. They have loved this guy for a long time. He is going to have a huge role down the stretch. I think, what do you think of Kyron's return and anything else Rams related? Yeah, he's a league winner, and he's so good in the in the receiving game. They got him going on screens, sort of like the old Todd Gurley days in this game. He finished with six for 61 and two touchdowns in the air. Um, their running game looks really, really good right now as a unit. They even have Royce Freeman rolling a little bit. Royce Freeman's put together like back-to-back good games. He's going to stay involved, but Kyron Williams is the clear-cut lead dog in this offense, their run blocking has been outstanding. Um, yeah, I mean, Kyron Williams is a league winner. Okay, agreed. The second big story from the Rams is this Cooper Cup stuff. So you remember in week 11, Cooper Cup left early with what was described as a mild ankle sprain, didn't make it back in the game. Friday of this week, he practices full, not on the final injury report, for the Arizona game. I know some people played him in cash. I was just like really scared by the whole thing. He appeared to tweak it or he got it retaped very early in that game. He still ended up playing 59 out of 64 snaps against the Cardinals did Cooper Cup. He ran 34 routes on 34 Stafford dropbacks, but only five targets for a 15% share. That is not Cooper Cup. Like something is off, whether it's the ankle, something just feels really off to me on Cooper Cup. Any thoughts on him? rest of season, Evan, or anything else on Rams pass game? I don't feel good about it. You know, initially when he came back, he looked like he was going to be back to his old self. It's now been like four or five games since he's been productive in an individual game. Obviously still struggling with the injury. And, you know, Matthew Stiver starting to look other ways. Yeah. So it's I, – I, I think he's still a start in season long. But, I mean, he's getting – he's falling into like the wide receiver three range. Yeah. And I mean, I don't I don't think we could play him in daily fantasy at this point. I mean, we had some questions on the last minute live stream on Sunday morning. You know, who would you play straight up on FanDuel? They were roughly the same price, Tank Dell or Cooper Cup. It sounds crazy, but Evan and I both said Tank Dell. I wouldn't say I felt great about it, but we both said Tank Dell and that worked out. It's just crazy. That's how high Tank Dell has gotten. We'll get to him in a second and how low Cooper Cup has gotten. Second biggest story of the week, Carolina Panthers lose to the Titans. Carolina Panthers fall to one and 10. Another dreadful Bryce Young game. After the game, Frank Reich fired. And apparently there were some like David Tepper expletives mixed in there before the official announcement came. Listen, man. I mean, I didn't think Frank Reich was doing a good job. In fact, I thought he was doing a bad job. I'm not sure that 11 games is enough to actually evaluate a guy though, but clearly was not getting the job done. Evan, what was your reaction to the firing here of Frank Reich? I guess not that surprised. I mean, I'm a fan of Frank Reich, and I think that he will resurface probably as an offensive coordinator and play caller elsewhere and definitely has a chance at success. But it it began early early on this season. Remember when he started hinting that the owner was a meddlesome owner in like a public press conference. I think that was like – that was early. I mean, week three, week four, something like that. And then they they did this carousel where they gave Thomas Brown play calling duties. Actually, got their first win in a game over C.J. Stroud's Texans. And then Frank Reich pulls him back a few weeks later. It, it just it started to get weird. And I think in hindsight, not surprising. They're one in ten. You know they're horrible. They also fired uh, assistant head coach, running backs Deuce Staley. They fired quarterback coach. Josh McCown, mm-hmm. um, and they're going to move forward with Chris Tabor, a uh, special teams guy, as their head coach, and Thomas Brown gets back the the OC duties. Yeah, I mean, 
people are going nuts on Tepper about this, you know, not giving guys enough time, et cetera. I don't know. They looked like it, it, they were hurting Bryce Young's development. I'm not saying it's going to be better now without Frank Reich. It probably won't make any change at all, but I don't want to put it all on Frank Reich or all on Bryce Young. How do you think this affects Bryce Young, Adam Thielen, Chuba for fantasy, if at all, going forward? I think at the end of the day, the biggest problem that Bryce Young has faced is the lack of quality talent around him and that's not going to change so i don't think that we should expect any big bumps or anything from the panthers offense going forward adam thielen is coming off with his slowest game of the season they got jonathan mingo going a little bit in this last one i guess the one the one note in this previous game was that they went back to chubba hubbard as the lead back Although they they finished with like similar t- uh, touch counts yep. against Tennessee, yep. uh, but Chubba Hubbard played a lot more and played a lot more in the passing game. Yeah. So I don't know from a usage standpoint, it, it looks like Chubba Hubbard moved back into the lead back role. But in terms of touches, they were uh, they were fairly even, or at least in terms of carries. Yeah, exactly. The carries I think will be kind of similar, but Chuba's role is clearly way 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 better. Mm-hmm. Ravens. So they played the Sunday night game against the Chargers in LA and got a relatively easy win. Didn't even think the Ravens played that well, but it was still a relatively easy win. The reason that we have this as the number three biggest story of the week is because we saw a role change for Keaton Mitchell. Snaps in this game, Keaton Mitchell 33, Justice Hill 20, Gus Edwards 19. Keaton also led in in routes. Keaton ran 14 routes, Justice 12, Gus 4. Keaton also led in opportunities, 11 opportunities for him, nine for Gus, six for justice. It struck me that it was a big change to see the Ravens put confidence. He started the game to Keaton Mitchell. He was the lead back. I still think the goal line stuff would go to Gus, but I thought it was a big change that Keaton got his nose in front here. Evan, what'd you think of Ravens backfield? Anything else Ravens related? Yeah. And that, and that change made, that change was made with Gus Edwards playing well. I mean, Gus Edwards has been running pretty hot. Mm -hmm. So they just identified, hey, we need a you know a little bit more explosiveness from our backfield, and made that little switch, and that's I mean that's good. And they also got Keaton Mitchell involved in the passing game more than he has been to this point. It's only two targets, but he turned them into twenty five yards, averaged seven yards per carry on the ground. You know he's got big play ability, and I think that, you know it, it makes all the sense in the world for for them to continue to raise his role. I'd like to see him maybe up in the 60 percent range. Going forward, this was an awesome game for Zay Flowers. Scored a touchdown, um, a three-yard uh, receiving touchdown, also a 37-yard touchdown on a jet sweep. Um, Isaiah Likely, yeah. 73% of the snaps, led the team in receiving. I know you want to talk about him. Oh, baby. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I I thought that there were people like, oh, what are you talking about, Adam? Charlie Kolar is healthy now, and and – Todd Monken's the OC. People just want to disrespect Isaiah Likely because he went to Coastal Carolina because he was good in the preseason. I don't think that the Ravens want to disrespect him. I think they want him to play the Mark Andrews role. And it looked like the Mark Andrews role. 33 slot snaps, 15 in line, four wide. Likely ran 30 routes on 36 Lamar dropbacks. He had an 18.7% target share. He's not nearly as good, obviously, as... Mark Andrews, but he's going to play that role and likely had 440-0 in this game. Easily could have been more. I thought he looked good out there. So, yeah, for anyone out there who needs tight end help, hopefully you already added Isaiah Likely, but he should not be available anywhere, uh, in my opinion. So, yeah, good debut, I thought, in Mark Andrews' first game out for Likely. People dis- dissing Isaiah Likely for Coastal Carolina. Like, Coastal Carolina had a, a year where they were, like, really aw- – where they were awesome Yeah, with Isaiah Likely as one of their featured – uh, uh, receiving weapons. He had 12 touchdowns in his final season at Coastal Carolina, over 900 yards. And we saw him last year. He, he had a great rookie year. He's he's legit. Fourth biggest story from Week 12 comes from Pittsburgh. This was the first game of the post-Matt Canada era. Steelers beat Jake Browning in Cincinnati. Lots to chew on here. So first, the offense went over 400 yards. Matt Canada's was the offensive coordinator in 2021, 2022, and all of 2023 until this last game never reached 400 yards. 
Also, Matt Canada's teams have never been over 4.9 yards per play. In the first game without Matt Canada, they're at 6.2 yards per play. Now, obviously, Cincinnati's defense has been struggling massively, and that played a big role. And the Steelers still didn't light up the scoreboard. They couldn't score touchdowns. But clearly a big step forward. Evan, how much do you think of Steelers' offensive success Sunday was Matt Canada gone related versus Bengals defense related versus something else. Well, a big switch that they made was to start throwing the ball in the middle of the field. And Pat Fryermuth, who I dissed last week, and I had to capitulate and bend the knee on him because, I mean, you know, in fairness to me, though, I mean, he, he'd he been so unproductive to that point. But he is a legit good player. You know, we, we've seen enough of Pat Fryermuth to know that. And they got him more involved. And he responded nine catches for 120 on 11 targets. I think he had more receiving yards than any player in the league. Correct. This past week. Correct. Shout out Penn State. Um, the other thing. So we talked about this rap sheet report on Sunday morning. The rap sheet quote unquote report was that with Canada gone, new OC, they're going to go to more George Pickens to more Jalen Warren. Not true. Snaps were Najee Harris, 38. Jalen Warren, 34. Total opportunities, Jalen Warren, 16. Najee, 15. That is exactly in the same range that it's been all year. So that was not a change. George Pickens only saw five targets for a 15% share. That's roughly been where he's been at for the whole year too. So the speculation that this would be really good for Warren and George Pickens, I was always a little queasy on that narrative. I thought maybe it had some validity, but people were talking about it like it was a slam dunk. Jalen Warren got up to like 20% owned or something crazy. Wow. on DraftKings this week. So yeah, it didn't happen. Evan, any thoughts on Pickens, Jalen Warren stuff? We talked about that on Sunday, and it just seemed like Rap she was trying to read the tea leaves, yep. and it wasn't like a legit report. Um, and I think that that kind of turned out to be the case. I'll tell you what, though. They got Arizona coming up, and we just saw Kyron, what he did to Arizona, and teams have been ripping them with the run. I think Jalen Warren, he should be very popular this week again, for, but for for a better reason. It's, it's such a good matchup. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's hard to see Jalen Warren touching the ball more than 10 to 15, 16 times in a game, but in certain spots, that can work. Patriots, fifth biggest story. First half against the Giants. Patriots scores zero points. Mac Jones throws for 89 yards on 21 attempts. He throws two interceptions, no touchdowns. Looks completely inept. They go to Bailey Zappi, which I think was expected at halftime, considering how bad Mac was struggling. Bailey Zappi throws it 14 times and only accumulates 54 passing yards, no touchdowns. I mean, they are so bad at every position, but quarterback has hit rock bottom, it feels like now. Evan, what do you think of the decision to bench Mac at halftime? Any thoughts on Patriots stuff going forward? I mean, I even wrote in matchups when I was talking about this game that I expected both quarterbacks to play in, in the game. And that is what happened. It, it doesn't move the needle either way, I don't think. Um, regardless who, of who they put under center, they're going to be bad. Pop Douglas had six for 49 mm -hmm. on nine targets, but he's dealing with um, a potential concussion. Yes. And Bill Belichick was asked about it. And Troy Brown, the receivers coach, was asked about it. And they're like, I don't know. I don't know if he's in the concussion protocol. Like, they can't even tell us. They can't even be transparent at all and tell us if this guy is, you know, being checked for a concussion. So that that's annoying. This was an awesome game for Ramondre Stevenson. We talked about it on Sunday morning. The Giants had already traded away Leonard Williams. They were somewhat surprisingly without Dexter Lawrence and Ramondre eight. I think Ramondre was on Austin Fountain's team. Yes, correct. Yep. Uh, he also had five catches, only nine yards, but that's hey, that's five fantasy points. For sure. Um, yeah, and now now Ramondre Stevenson, he has 23 and 26 touches over his last two games. I mean, there's no – I don't – the Mac Jones thing is over, and Bailey Zappi is not the answer. I think they, they may as well just, just feed Ramondre the rest yeah. of the way. You know, I didn't play any Ramondre, and that was a mistake uh, clearly by me. I just – on a team where they're so unlikely to score touchdowns and on a team where Ezekiel Elliott is still going to touch the ball eight, nine, 10 times a game, I couldn't stomach it, but projections liked 
reminds you a ton that I should have just played it. You know, I should have just played the spot, um, but I didn't. So yeah. shout out to you though for uh, calling the Giants winning outright. Outright, outright. I'm gonna go professional sides and totals better now. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it for the top five stories of the week. Let's get into it now alphabetically with the NFC, and we'll start with the Arizona Cardinals. Just get stomped at home by the Rams. Kyler Murray did run in a touchdown, but only ran for two yards in this game. On the good side, Marquise Brown, I was surprised Marquise Brown even played. He barely practiced all week through this heel injury, but he looked fine to me. He went 6-88-0 on 12 targets, and of course, on the good side, our king, Trey McBride, seven more catches, but yeah. Not a good performance overall by the Cardinals. Evan, any thoughts on them? Um, <clears throat> yeah, Kyler. So since Kyler had 49 dropbacks in this game. So from weeks one, and this is via fan, uh, Football Insights on Twitter, the Cardinals in weeks one through nine, before Kyler came back, their neutral adjusted pass rate was 42%. That was lowest in the NFL. During since Kyler returned three games ago, they have the fourth highest situation neutral adjusted pass rate at 62%. So they're being a lot more aggressive in the passing game with Kyler Murray under center. And, you know, this wasn't his best game out of, out of his three starts, but he'd still finish with uh, like 21 fantasy points. Yeah. Um, and he is a top five fantasy quarterback since he returned from injured reserve. Again, I think he's an every week fantasy starter the rest of the way. Yeah. I mean, that's what you get from Kyler is, yeah, he didn't run for a lot of yards, but he ran in a touchdown. You get that floor ceiling combo from him. He's also throwing to like three five foot seven guys right now, effectively. Michael Wilson didn't play in this game. Again, Cardinals play at Steelers, then by, then home versus 49ers. I mean, if you have Cardinals guys, this is the worst possible stretch at the most important time. Again, at Steelers, then a bye versus 49ers. So, yeah, not good. Go to Atlanta. This was a massive AFC South game, uh, Atlanta against New Orleans. Desmond Ritter returns, and the Falcons find a way to win. And they won with B. B. John Robinson getting 22 opportunities, with Drake London leading the team in targets. Oh, look what happens. They played well. Now, I think they did benefit from injuries to Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid on the on the Saints side, but still really important win for the Falcons who now control the NFC South. Evan, what do you think of King Arthur and the Falcons here? Um, they were dominant in the running game. You know, it it it, it was not a, a Bijan fully takeover game, but obviously he uh, he scored twice. He's receiving touchdown and he looked like a wide receiver. Um but they just gashed the Saints, who actually lost Cam Jordan during this game. They gashed the Saints with their power running game and just uh, and a lot of explosive plays as well. So this was about this was like what Arthur Smith, I think, wants, with the exception of two interceptions by Desmond Ritter. This is kind of what I think that Arthur Smith wants the Falcons offense to look like. Yeah. Even 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 CPAT, eight for forty three on the ground. Well, that's the thing. Bijan only had 16 of 34 running back carries in this game. But man, getting off 34 running back carries is a ton. And 16 for Bijan is not spectacular, but it's fine. I think more importantly, Bijan saw six targets for 28% share. And like 16 carries plus 20 plus percent of the targets is a really good role for Bijan. Last note I had on Atlanta, they face Carolina. Indy and Chicago in week 15, 16, 17. Going to be hard to find a better playoff schedule than that than Atlanta's. Let's go to Chicago Bears last night. Somehow squeeze out a late win in a really ugly game against Josh Dobbs and the Vikings. I mean, they came out with the most horizontal passing game plan I may have ever seen. Fields was just literally throwing the ball sideways for the entire first half. His eight out was 3.4 yards overall for this game after being at 12.3 the previous week. However, 22 designed runs over the last two weeks for Fields was huge. I want to get to the Roshan Johnson stuff in a second here, Evan, but what do you think of Fields and the Bears getting a good win last night? It's funny. I put in my notes the exact same thing that you just said. 
Bears ran most horizontal passing offense I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> Virtually every play was a screen pass. They're so stupid. <laughs> Career low 2.7 yard A dot. Third lowest A dot of any game of any quarterback in a game this season. They ran a screen play. I think it was to Roshan from at third and 13. Uh, they're, they're at the 13 yard line. Like going in going into the end zone. That's a condensed space when, when you're like pr- fairly deep in the red zone. So what do you think what do you think that Roshan Johnson is going to do? Like turn into Barry Sanders and like juke out like three linebackers and two defensive backs? Like that was the the most annoying call I've ever seen just begging for um a field goal. Yeah. Just I, just begging for a field goal. I think that they thought Justin Fields could not handle Minnesota Vikings blitz and mm. let's just throw everything short and quick and horizontal because he can't handle the blitz, which well, it is true that one of the ways to defeat the blitz is to throw screen passes and, and try to get the, you know, the, the defense that is coming forward, get them on skates. But, um, but every single pass. That's the thing. It got really predictable. Oh God. It was, it was a pain. It was painful to watch for sure. The, Big news, though, I think, was... I don't know how sticky you thought this was. Roshan Johnson, the snaps in this game were Roshan Johnson 51, Cleo Herbert 15. Routes were Roshan Johnson 22, Cleo Herbert 7. Opportunities, Roshan 15, Cleo Herbert 8. This is... I thought Roshan would play more that he had a week with Deontay Foreman out, but I had no... I would have never thought in a million years that he would have gone full takeover Roshan Johnson like we had it projected stone wrong like yeah like we, I mean we were just way off I never would have thought this what do you think of Roshan taking over for Khalil last night well I think that it was the right move but I'm with you I think in matchups I had I mean why I just noted what what happened in the previous game and that was clear Herbert was the clear-cut main dude it was like in the previous game it was like 18 to 5 in touches and it seemed to me like they uh they came out like and they used both guys a little bit early in the game, and they kind of felt like maybe Roshan had the hotter hand. And and really, Roshan better profiles as a true every-down back type. And Khalil Herbert, I think, is best suited for a change of pace role, and that's what happened here. I thought Roshan delivered. I thought he looked really good in the passing game. They've been running the ball well really all season regardless of which running back has been in the backfield. I mean, they didn't tear it up, you know, from from a running from a, a rushing efficiency standpoint in this game. And now they have a bye, so maybe Deontay Foreman will be back after yeah. that. But if he's not, and he has a high ankle sprain. Those, those suck. We know that. Um, I, I think that they do best by their by themselves by themselves to continue to feature Roshan Johnson and have Khalil Herbert in the change of pace role. And develop him. I mean, if Roshan Johnson can be a feature back for them, they have a starting running back at yeah. a rookie contract for the next four years or three more years. I mean, that's pretty valuable. Yeah. Cowboys. So Thanksgiving game, everybody gets to see Dak playing the best football of his career. I mean, this Dak run that he's on right now, and I get that it's been against weak opponents, but man, dude is absolutely shredding. And Dallas has these insane pass rates. Now, Home against the Commanders is one of the best spots you can get. But again, Dak, four more touchdowns in this game. Over his last five games, Dak has 17 touchdowns and two interceptions. I mean, he's making a legit, from a statistical standpoint, he has, I think, the best MVP case, just from straight stats. Now, can his team catch the Eagles and win the NFC East for him to win the the MVP? I think that probably has to happen for him to win it. But, man, he's definitely in the conversation now. What do you think of? Cowboys, another offensive pass game explosion on Thanksgiving. I mean, their offense is absolutely rolling. They're, you know, they're healthy. Um, they are uh, blocking out the sun right now up front. And I think they've got another good matchup on deck against Seattle at home. They've been destroying at home for an extended period. That matchup right up is is up on the side already. Cowboys against Seahawks. I, I mean, I think that they've got another chance to score another thirty points. Yeah, you know their their offense is rolling, and and they started to get Tony Pollard going over his last two games, averaging five point six yards per carry, 
92 total yards from scrimmage and five catches yeah. over the Cowboys last two games. Um, and that the Seahawks have been getting destroyed by RBs. So I, I think that they're, they're set up for continued success. Yeah. On the Pollard thing, you know, it was, I played Pollard on the Thanksgiving slate. I, I thought that his usage was good. I thought he looked good. It was frustrating that they ran that screen for Rico Dowdle and it went for a touchdown, you know, kind of around the goal line again. But I don't think that was any indictment on Pollard whatsoever. I thought he played a pretty good game. It's just, man, when you're going to throw the ball at like the highest rate in the league, it's going to be harder for Pollard if he's not featured in the pass game. But like Evan said, he's been catching the ball, and I think it just is what it is at this point on Pollard. Oh, and Brandon Cooks, they've yeah. really got him going over the last three games. You know, oh, they, yeah. they've pushed Michael Gallup into the background, deservedly so, although he's made a couple plays for them recently. Yeah. Um, but, but featuring Brandon Cooks, uh, he had a season high in playing time against Washington on Thanksgiving, 80% of the snaps, and over his last three, 19 targets, 16 catches, 287 yards, two touchdowns, averaging 18 yards per catch. It took them too long to figure out how to use Brandon Cooks, but I think they're doing it right now. Yeah, last thing I want to say on the Cowboys, um, at this point in the season, if you're a season-long bro and you have a good team, these running backs who are one injury away are so valuable, you know? And like, I've been stashing on my good teams. I've been stashing Rico Dowdle for a while. If something happened to Tony Pollard, I think Rico Dowdle would smash. Um, and like we saw today, you know, we'll get to the Colts in a little bit, but Jonathan Taylor apparently has some thumb injury. Zach Moss could win people leagues. And hopefully you have him on your team as a guy who's one injury away from a really big role. Lions. So this is another Thanksgiving game. Another bad golf game. I mean... I haven't seen Goff play this poorly at home really since he joined the Lions. I mean, the final line that Goff had for fantasy looked okay, but a lot of that was garbage time. He lost three fumbles. He got sacked three times. Was not a good Goff Lions performance here against the Packers. Evan, what do you think of Lions stuff from Thanksgiving? <clears throat> yeah, this is a team that is built around the lines, really. Offensive line, defensive line, and they are not getting the high-level offensive line play that they did early in the year. They've had a couple of injuries, but not enough that you would think that it would, it would start to become this big of a problem. Rashawn Gary tore them apart on Thanksgiving. Um, you know, the, the running game is still going strong, but uh, Jared Goff – you know, he's, he's been really good for the Lions, okay? But Jared Goff is a quarterback that you need to protect. Yeah. Um, because when because when because when plays break down, he's not a second reaction, you know, out of structure playmaker. So you, you need to protect him. And when they can't protect him, he's you know, he's gonna have bad games. And and he's had two bad games in a row. Uh the running back split I thought was interesting. In the first half, Jameer Gibbs did not play much at all and was not featured much at all. In the second half, they get behind. And Jameer Gibbs plays a ton. I mean, he was out there for like every single play. Jameer Gibbs ended up running 42 routes. Just feels to me like it should be drive by drive. And some games they've gone drive by drive. But I'm also afraid that when they're winning, it's going to be more Montgomery. When they're losing, it's going to be more Gibbs. Any takes for you on the Gibbs-Montgomery split from that Thanksgiving game? Nothing to add to what you had there. I, I wanted to reiterate, though, that Jamison Williams has earned and locked himself into the number three receiver role for the Lions, he is not earning big target numbers yet. Um, but he went two for 51 on Thanksgiving. I think he went two for 44 and one in the previous game. So, I mean, he's he's showing his playmaking ability. It's just he has not yet begun to earn a, a large target share. Yeah, for sure. Usage has been, or at least role has been good for Jamison Williams. Was a good, cheap play on Thanksgiving. Speaking of that game, we'll go to the Packers now. So Jordan Love, man, kid was firing in that game. And like he throws a super tight ball. You know, they were showing Goff's balls that looked like ducks a lot. I mean, the ball coming out of Jordan Love's hand was fire. Um, I thought Jordan Love was really good against the Chargers in the week before. He was awesome against the Lions. Packers are now back to five and six. And in the playoff hunt, they got Christian Watson going and Jaden Reed going for a big game here. I mean, Watson went 594. One, so it was a really, really encouraging game, I thought, for Packers' pass game. What do you think of Green Bay stuff, Evan? 
Yeah, you know, I, I've been low on Jordan Love um, really since he came out of college. And I think over the last three or four games, you know, I, I'm kind of I'm, – I'm, I'm, I think I'm ready to change my tune. or I'm very, very tempted to change my tune because dude is balling. Uh, over his last three, not a super high completion rate, 62.5%, but he's averaging eight yards per pass attempt, seven touchdowns, two interceptions, eight for 50 on the ground. He's athletic. He's not like – a super aggressive scrambler or anything, but he's definitely got that in his bag. And you're right. The way that he's been throwing the football and the play of these young receivers, um, I, I it's like fun. It's like a fun offense to watch. And I, I didn't have any optimism that it, that was going to be the case in like week four or week five. Two injury notes. Luke Musgrave does not sound good. The situation on him. It sounds like he could be out for a while, if not the year. Tucker Craft ran 29 routes on 33 dropbacks in this game did catch a touchdown also they played this game without aaron jones due to an mcl injury doesn't sound overly serious but aaron jones will probably be out again i would expect this aj dylan usage to be sticky aj dylan 14 of 17 running back carries on thanksgiving three of four targets like we've talked about he's been struggling massively for efficiency but role is going to be there i think for aj dylan vikings Holy Josh Dobbs meltdown, man. I mean, Dobbs was so bad against the Bears last night, four interceptions, that the team, the Vikings, are talking about evaluating their quarterback situation during the bye. I mean, it was like a week ago, people were talking about Josh Dobbs MVP, which was ridiculous in the beginning, but uh, they were talking about Josh Dobbs MVP, and now the Vikings are like, well, we're going to evaluate our quarterback position during the bye. That's how bad Josh Dobbs and this Vikings offense was last night. It's hard for me to put my finger on exactly what happened here. Evan, any thoughts on the Vikings laying an egg at home in an island game last night? Well, number one, I think that the Bears deserve some credit because the Bears defense, littered with first and second year players, has started to come together a little bit. They're not they're not the pushover that they were early in the season. They got their hands on a lot of passes. Well, four interceptions, that'll happen, right? Jalen Johnson had another one that he could have returned for a pick six, but they had like tip passes at the line. Um, and Josh Dobbs, you know, I think Kevin Cole, uh, who runs his own website now, worked for PFF for a long time, put it, put it well that Josh Dobbs was always going to be like a high variance sort of player. And he hit the bottom end of the variance in this game against Chicago. And yeah, now they go into the buy. So they have some time to, to evaluate. Um, they have Nick Mullins available and, um, you know, I, I think that they can maybe take a look at him, but I, I you know, Josh Dobbs is a backup, man. Josh yeah. Dobbs is a backup, and, and and he's had some awesome fantasy games, and we all wanted to believe in him, but he's a backup in the NFL. That that's totally fine. I still think he's better than Nick Mullins, and I would not. Well, I do too. And I would not. I would give him a chance to play with Justin Jefferson before I said that he's worse than Nick Mullins. You know, like and Justin Jefferson was activated from IR today. He'll practice or whatever during the bye would expect Justin Jefferson to play when they come out of the bye there in week 14. Last Vikings note, I thought last night was at least a chance, an assumption of rational, rational coaching that they would go to a featured Ty Chandler. They declined to do so. And I thought Madison played well. You know, Madison yeah. out-snapped Chandler 31-18. Madison actually ran more routes than Chandler 16-7. to Madison 12-6. It's just this whole run game is so broken. I mean, Madison's been bad slash fine but he so rarely gets above even 10 or 15 DraftKings points. The whole run game is so broken. So, yeah. They also ran like three plays in the first quarter. I mean, they, right. they didn't have the ball very much. I mean, they, well, they kept giving it to the other team too. Exactly. Saints. So Derek Carr returns from his injuries for this massive NFC South game against the Falcons. Goes for over 300 yards, but man, red zone woes. I mean, they scored no touchdowns. They kicked five field goals and scored no touchdowns. Did the Saints in this game. Certainly did not help that Michael Thomas was out. And then Chris Olave, who was going nuclear in the first half, gets a concussion. He's out the rest of the game. By the way, I think that's Chris Olave's third concussion since he entered the NFL. Uh, I would have to check that. But uh, And Rashid Shahid, they lost to a thigh injury also. So, I mean, they were down pretty bad here. But still, five field goals is not going to get it done. Evan, what do you think of Saints loss to the Falcons? I think you summed it up pretty well. Um, you know, Derek Carr isn't good. Uh, and I think that we're seeing that they can't score in the red zone like at all. 
Yeah. Uh, the Rashid Shahid injury sounds somewhat significant. Yeah. And I know Underhill was saying that he doesn't think that Shahid is going to play in their next game. So they'll be down Rashid Shahid. They'll be down Michael Thomas. And I don't know. I, I, they might be down. Well, they probably will be down Chris Olave. That's what, yeah. So you you got to think that a lot of Alvin Kamara coming up against Detroit. Yeah. God, that is going to be real difficult without any of your starting wide receivers. That's brutal run out also for Olave and Shahid because Olave was going to go nuts. I mean, he had over 100 yards on just 22 routes in that game before sustaining the concussion. And I still like Shahid as just more targets with these guys out. But yeah, not meant to be. Could also be a Taysom Hill game coming up. Yeah. Giants. So I was actually thinking about playing some Jalen Hyatt on Sunday. But then once Darius Slayton, who was doubtful, got ruled in, I got off that. Jalen Hyatt still ran 23 routes on 33 dropbacks, went 5 one oh nine zero. So you get the Jalen Hyatt breakout here, which I think should be sticky. Like, not the breakout sticky, but they should just let the kid play the rest of the year because he needs development, and you might as well. But yeah, good win here, I guess, for the Giants. I mean, two of the most least exciting teams to watch in the entire NFL played in this game, the Giants and the Patriots. So I guess we'll call it a good win. What'd you think of Giants? The only note I had was shout out Levitan for giving us the Giants money line. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I actually think like Saquon's like playing well, but the situation is so bad that it's just like hard to play him. You know, in season long, you got to play him. But in DFS, I know he had some a couple big games and I know he's really low owned every week. It's just tough. It's just tough. Eagles absolutely ridiculous win for the Eagles. I should say another ridiculous win. I mean, they have had some insane wins this year. This one was maybe the wildest. You get a 50 something yard field goal in the rain to send into overtime. You get Gabe Davis and Josh Allen, not on the same page. And then you get Jalen hurts going down and running for a touchdown. The MVP case for hurts is simply that he is accounting for so many touchdowns on a team with the best record in the league. He is now plus plus one fifty, the favorite to be, the NFL's MVP. I think he deserves it. You know, people hate on the tush push so much. I watched so many quarterback sneaks and fourth and ones where teams either fail the quarterback yeah. sneak, fail the tush push. Baker Mayfield tried one from the goal line and got freaking hurt. Didn't get in the end zone and got hurt. It's a skill what they're doing. And Jalen Hurts is just has the team so under control at all times. So yeah, I'm not going to take anything away from Jalen Hurts, obviously for fantasy. Five touchdowns in this game. So many rushing touchdowns. It's insane. But yeah, wild win for the Eagles. Evan, what were your takeaways from this one? Uh, such an awesome game to watch, number one. Number two, the Eagles are now 27-2 and two in their last 29 regular season games. You remember we talked about, the obviously, the Lane Johnson last-minute scratch, basically. They were just fine. Uh, they stuck Jack Driscoll in there at right tackle, and I think he gave up a pressure like on the first play of the game. And then he was good to go the rest of the way. So that that is promising looking forward. They got San Francisco on deck. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully they can get back Lane Johnson. Without Dallas Goddard and Grant Calcaterra, they're well, two of their top three tight ends. They used more four receiver sets. They got back Ol Olamide Zacchaeus and um, Quez Watkins and Julio Jones. And obviously, AJ, uh, AJ Brown and um, and Devontae Smith up top, and they used four receiver sets. So they showed the ability to um, kind of switch up their personnel usage to account for missing players. There have been reports that Dallas Goddard could maybe come back against San Francisco, but it's more likely that he comes back in week 14 against the Cowboys. Yeah, another slow A.J. Brown game here and another really good Devonta Smith game. I think that's mostly random slash noisy, but you can't deny the splits when Dallas Goddard is out. Devonta Smith has been a baller. Yes. Almost every time that Devonta Smith has been out. Um, Dude, did you look at the lines yet? I mean, I don't know if you have, but if you if you didn't, what would you guess the line was for 49ers at Eagles this week? Eagles... Minus two. Yeah. I, I would have said like a pick or Eagles minus one. I've seen some 49ers minus three. 
and consensus is like 49ers minus two. I mean, that is a slap in the face to the Eagles and their fans. Mm. I have no idea. You know. Oh God. Oh, it's it not is, the it's, fans. It's a slap it. Dude, they're gonna be going nuts on Sunday. I've already been getting a ton of texts. Can you believe that where they use the term we, of course, because they grew up in Philly? Do you believe that we we are three point dogs at home? We're the best team in the NFL. We're three point dogs at home, you know. And I get it, but yeah, it's it's an awesome game. I can't wait. Can't wait to watch that game. We were ruined, we were robbed of that game last year when Brock Purdy got hurt. Uh in the first quarter yep yeah oh yeah oh that was that sucked because that would that looked like it was going to be an awesome game hopefully we get an awesome one here i, I think we will yeah so um this was a short week and gino had the elbow issue the thanksgiving situation they also played without kenneth walker i mean it was just a mess and maybe we should have seen this coming i know you and wiggins were on the 49ers uh stuff here in this game they got whitewashed but again gino elbow no Kenneth Walker, short week. It was just a mess. They had no chance against a healthy 49ers team. What do you think of Seahawks on Thanksgiving? I thought it was pretty predictable, man. You know, it's just they are extremely overmatched. They were missing, you know, uh, their, uh, you know, several of their big time skill position players, almost all of them were dealing with something because DK Metcalf missed a bunch of practice time. Tyler Lockett had the hamstring. Uh, Kenneth Walker was out. Geno Smith had the elbow. It's just that that was one of the easier bets of the year. 49ers minus seven. And uh I, I'm 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 worried about this upcoming schedule for Seattle. They got Dallas next, and then they got what I think like Philly or something like that. And San, they play San Francisco again soon. Yeah. Like I, I'm worried about their offensive production for sure for the next three weeks. Yeah. Charbonnet in his first full NFL start 14 47 zero rushing 4 11 zero receiving I actually thought he played pretty well I mean there was like nowhere for him to go against the San Francisco's defense but I actually thought that the role was awesome and he played pretty well we'll see on Charbonnet's role going forward yeah and the passing game did not like very little as a whole Gino only threw for 180 but uh Char Charvarius Ward the 49ers top cornerback he did a number on DK Metcalf uh, he was in shadow coverage for the majority of the game. DK Metcalf finished with 32 scoreless yards on nine targets. Let's go to the San Francisco side here. Uh, they get up 24 to three on Seattle at the halftime, like we just talked about, coasted from there. Of course, Christian McCaffrey, unstoppable. They also get Debo going, nine targets, four carries. I think when Debo has these kind of games, again, nine targets, four carries, it's just hard for Ayuk and Kittle because it's so efficient. Like, the Debo and the CMC touches go for 20, 30 yards. They go for long touchdowns. You just don't get that many plays off. And so when one or two of those guys is getting volume and going off, it's so hard for the other guys to do so. So that's just something I think about with DFS and stacking the 49ers. It can be hard. But yeah, obviously just an incredibly talented team as a whole. What do you think of 49ers on Thanksgiving? Got it done, man. You know, got it done. Um, the one note that I have is just that Brock Purdy over his last three games, he's been on fire. 75% completion rate, seven touchdowns, one interception, 10.4 yards per pass attempt. Their offense is rolling in all phases. Their offensive line has gotten healthy after dealing with some injuries, you know, about three, four weeks ago. And all their skill position players are healthy. I, you know, I, I get it. I get it. I get why San Francisco would be favored over Seattle. I think that's uh, San Philly, Francisco. Yeah. I'm, I'm over Philly. I think that San Francisco is the best team in the NFL. Yeah. Right now, but I, I just thought that there would be at least a little bit of a, an edge there. I mean, because the Eagles are a legit Super Bowl team too, and they're at home. So that, wow. that's why that's why I went with minus two, and I, obviously I was wrong. Yeah. I mean, home field advantage is not worth what it used to be in the NFL, but right. it is in some places. And I think the Eagles have a legit home field advantage but yeah awesome game again um oh purdy if the 49ers win on sunday you're gonna see purdy's mvp odds come down a lot he's like 15 16 to 1 right now i have some purdy 22 to 1 my concern on purdy actually winning the award is that every the narrative out there and it's a fair narrative is that they're so talented purdy's just playing point guard you know he's not the reason they're winning it's all this other talent they have on the team and that's why people wouldn't vote 
for Purdy, even if they end up as the NFC's number one seed and he has pretty good stats. But I do think that like 15, 16 to 1, 20 to 1, if they beat the Eagles, that could go down to 6 to 1 in a hurry. I mean, in a real hurry. So yeah, just wanted to mention that. Bucks. Bucks go into Indy and lose. There were some weird plays in this game. I mean, very early on, Baker tried to sneak in a touchdown. He gets stuffed and hurts his ankle. He played through it the rest of the way, but did have an MRI after the game. MRI came back negative. He took six sacks in this game. But overall, I think it was as expected. I mean, they moved the ball. Mike Evans had a really good game, as we thought he could, as Evan was on. Rashad White, despite the knee issue or whatever popped up, I thought he was really good too. So kind of as expected for me on the Bucks. Evan, what do you see out of their loss in Indy? Well, I like that people are starting to – I keep seeing more buzz about Mike Evans being a Hall of Famer. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he almost scored three touchdowns in the game. He stepped out of uh, stepped out of, out, of, out of bounds at the one-yard line early in the game. Um, yeah, God. You know, I had on my team, I had Mike Evans, Derrick Henry, Bijan Robinson, Kyler, Trey McBride, Steelers D. They put up double digits. But still didn't win anything because I had Rashid Shahid and yeah. I don't know some other guy that was that was weak. But I, I don't. It was like a high scoring week. Very. Yeah, even in a week where we had a we didn't have like a a, a full not even nearly a full main slate because we had all the um you know the Thanksgiving yeah. games and and the two island games. The the thing is, in order to win, you need to have Josh Allen and Kyron both went over forty points. So mm-hmm. I mean, when guys go over forty points and they're owned like Josh Allen and Kyron, where you basically needed that to win. You know, so yep. is what it is. Um, oh, other note I had on the Bucks. This defense is just so bad. I mean, like I said, I don't think the offense played poorly. The defense just kept getting shredded and shredded. And yeah, shout out to Schefter on the Rashad White report. You know, he had very good details on that and gave confidence that we could start Rashad White despite the knee issue. Washington, last NFC team here. I mean... I knew they had no prayer with Sack Howell and their offensive line against the Cowboys defense, but they were only down 20 to 10 and a half of this Thanksgiving game. They end up losing though, 45 to 10. Note for fantasy I had was Antonio Gibson returned from his toe injury and it wasn't a huge deal, but he siphoned off six carries and four targets. And that's just not great for Brian Robinson whatsoever, especially in games where they're trailing most of the way like they were here. But yeah, Evan, any commander's thoughts off their Thanksgiving loss in Dallas. Um, Antonio Gibson wound up out snapping Brian Robinson, but that was because of the game script. Yeah, I mean, Washington was actually competitive competitive with them in the first half, uh, as you mentioned. Deron Bland has five pick sixes, which is an NFL record. I'm looking him up. Where he Where is he in the um, – awards market for defensive player of the year yeah i don't know i haven't even seen i haven't looked at that i that everybody just assumes that it's going to be one of the pass rushers you know miles garrett or uh right miles garrett's hurt oh deron bland up to 11 to 1 yeah yeah i mean i don't know if that's a bet but um oh one other note i had on on commanders so as who's leading the commanders in targets per route run this year Curtis not, Samuel? Yep. It's not Jahan Dotson, 14%. It's not Terry McLaurin, 19.8%. The leader in targets per route run is actually Curtis Samuel, 21.7%. So, yeah, Curtis Samuel is always the cheapest. He's always, but he doesn't play as much as those other guys. But when he's out there, they're targeting him plenty. Oh, and they did fire uh, Jack Del Rio after this game, um, the defensive coordinator. You know, this has been the worst defense in the NFL for all year. They have major personnel issues. I don't think firing Jack Del Rio will make a difference, but yeah, any thoughts on that one, Evan? He just uh, should he should have been fired a long time ago. Uh, yeah. He doesn't. He's just the game has passed him by. Like he doesn't do anything special defensively, and they you know he just tries to like he just puts the guys out there and says, "Hey, go win," and that's not. You know that that's not what other defenses are, are doing these days. You know, so like, you, the, the, like the difference between Mike McDonald's Ravens defense and Washington's defense. And there was a point at which they had Chase Young and Montez Sweat, and you know they used a first round pick on a cornerback, and yeah. like they they had they had comparable talent probably defensively to the Ravens entering the season. But you know the, the Ravens actually do stuff, and Jack Del Rio did not. 
So maybe, so you do think that'll make a difference then? You think Washington? I mean, I don't know. They're now, you know, they gave up, they gave up dudes. Yeah. So they they did have nine sacks the other game, although it was against Tommy DeVito, who has like an insane sack rate. Absolutely. Uh, I I saw Mark Denkin bring tweeting about that. Tommy DeVito has taken sacks on like 22% of his dropbacks or something. Yeah. We had a huge projection on Patriots defense this past week because of that, and that made a big difference. All right, let's move to the AFC now. We'll start with the Buffalo Bills. Wild, wild game in Philly like we already talked about. I think in these big games, in these games that get kind of high scoring, Josh Allen does this Superman thing, man. And I mean, that's kind of what they need to win at this point. They're bad on defense. They don't have great, great weaponry. You need Josh Allen Superman. Josh Allen threw it 51 times. Accounts for 339 pass yards and two touchdowns. Also runs it nine times for 81 yards and two touchdowns. And still not enough. I mean, outrageous 40-plus point game for Josh Allen and not enough. Evan, what do you think of the Bills, who, by the way, are now like long shots almost to win the AFC or anything like that? Yeah, they're in like eighth or ninth. They yeah. might, I think they're ninth in the AFC and it's a it's a tragedy because their losses they have six losses the margin of their losses have been six points five points four points six points two points and three points and four of their six losses have come in the final 30 seconds of regulation or in overtime so that's why you'll see them like real high in like DVOA and EPA and because they're not this bad of a team, but they've had so many unbelievably close losses at the end of games. And um, I almost kind of feel bad for them because they lost so much talent on defense. I I think that they got to keep doing the thing with Josh Allen, Superman, because that's going to give them their best chance to win. I also wanted to shout out Nick Menzio, my cousin, who, I don't know, people in the Sunday chat were like, that's a made-up name. That's not real. He used to work with us at Roto World and everything, yeah. like, for years. He got out of the game a little bit because he became, like, a firefighter. And anyways, he was all over Gabe Davis, who didn't have a catch the week before mm-hmm. to have a monster game against Philadelphia. And actually, he wound up winning the, the, the $3 entry snap. He didn't win it. He came in third. The $3 entry snap on DraftKings and won 5K and won – a bunch of other money on Gabe Davis bets. But I wanted to give him that shout out because that was an awesome call for a player who is in Gabe Davis who's been all over the place. Super frustrating season from Gabe Davis. But he he balled out until he screwed up the the final play. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like calling guys better in best ball because I think that's just like a cop out and doesn't really make a lot of sense. A lot of times people don't understand where I think upside comes from. But Gabe Davis is clearly better in best ball. Like, I, I mean, and this was an awesome spot for him, you know, as Mencio said. And uh, Coach Greg uh, actually had Gabe Davis on his winning team uh, there also. So, yeah, Gabe Davis played the kind of game that he can play. But this is the kind of player that beats the Eagles secondary. At this point, they're so slow back there, and they force so many attempts. So, yeah, Gabe Davis, 12 targets in this game, led the team 6-105, won really good. Cincy. The start of the Jake Browning era was a loss to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I thought Browning was okay. 19 of 26 for 227. A touchdown and an interception. Did take four sacks. Team could only muster 10 points. It was a tough matchup, though, against the Steelers. Evan, what would you think of Drake Browning's first start here of the season? Yeah, I mean, you know, you've been, you know, you're you're a big Jake Browning guy. That is not true. That is not true. So I got to give you the cap tip for, I mean, he was fine in a bad spot. Um, I didn't really have any big time notes on this. I did have that uh, Joey Porter, who's become really good for the Steelers as a second round rookie. And he was a player that people were, he was a polarizing guy because people thought that he was like too stiff in the hips or something like that, you know, Um, and then he might have to move to safety. But he's been really good for the Steelers. They actually moved Patrick Peterson out of the starting lineup to get Joey Porter in. He shadowed Jamar Chase in this game. You were kind of lucky to come away with 81 yards from Jamar Chase, considering all the situations, you know, all the all the things going on around him. You know, I just I'm throwing in the towel 
on this offense the rest of the way, though. Yeah, I, I think for season long, you have to continue to start Jamar Chase, or you most likely will continue to start Jamar Chase. The rest of these guys, if you wanted to bench, though, in some tough spots, you think you can at least consider it. Guys like Mixon, we'll see if T. Higgins makes it back, et cetera. Oh, I did have one more note, and that was that on Monday, Zach Taylor was asked about T. Higgins, and he did not sound confident that T. Higgins would be back this week. Yeah, I mean, at this point, T. Higgins is going to be a pending free agent, and yeah, he has no reason to go out there and put bad tape with Jake Browning out there, like none whatsoever. Let's go to Browns. Browns go into Denver to face the red-hot Broncos, and the Browns were never really in the game. I mean, they were just never really in it. DTR got hurt late. They got off a ton more David and Joku short passes. Jerome Ford, I thought, looked good, but still losing too much work to Kareem Hunt for my liking. So, yes, I think a discouraging performance from the Browns here, Evan. What do you see out of their loss in Denver? I would just add that it looks like it could be Joe Flacco time in Cleveland because P.J. Walker, it's just – Oh, they can't God. keep running him out there, man. He, he He's not good. Dude, Joe Flacco, the last time I saw him was like, I thought even money to throw a pick six. I mean, this guy was I, I just an absolute pick six machine. How old is Joe Flacco now? Hold on. I got to look this up. I thought you were going to say that you, because he's from uh, like the, the Philly area, that you were, that you saw him uh, out playing uh, basketball like no. in the street or something like that. Uh, he's actually not that old. He's 38 is Joe Flacco. Uh, he's in his 16th NFL season. Man, that would be crazy. I actually hadn't even thought that they would start him. That uh, That is interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think he's going to start. Yeah. He was on the sidelines on Sunday. Yeah, they play at Rams versus Jaguars versus Bears next. Uh, the one thing that we should add to that is that Amari Cooper suffered a rib injury and was ruled out for the game. Yeah. He finished with two for 16. Um He's expected to be okay. Broncos in this game. So Broncos beat the Browns. They have now won five in a row. Broncos somehow, some way are six and five on the season and in the hunt for the playoffs. I mean, Sean Payton was a laughing stock for going after Nathaniel Hackett and then losing 70 to 20. Now the Broncos have a really good chance actually to make the playoffs. They won this game with Russ just throwing for 134 yards. And Javante Williams averaging 3.6 yards per carry. Defense has played well lately. So, yeah, just real quietly, Broncos playing good football. What do you think of their win over the Browns? They've won five in a row, but three of them have been by two points or fewer. Mm -hmm. So they're like the, the oppo, -bills. oppo Bills, right? Bizarro Bills. Yeah, the Bizarro Bills. Yeah, I mean, I, this wasn't a good fantasy game from anyone. We did see uh, Javante Williams get you know get back into that twenty touch range. Uh, he had he had twenty one touches, season high seventy percent of snaps. So you remember they had that one game where it looked like they were going back to like a three man rotation. Javante was the main dude. Yeah, in this one, and it, even in routes, I mean Javante ran thirteen routes. P Ryan ran seven. McLaughlin ran ran seven as well. So yeah, just good to see Javante back up there with a solid one. Houston. CJ Stroud tried, man. He tried to be the hero and win another game for them. I thought CJ Stroud was very good again, but a lot of turnovers in the red zone kept this game from going completely off. Comeback falls short. Nico was awesome. Tank Dell was awesome. By the way, Tank Dell had a 62-yard catch called back by an illegal shift, which is so annoying. But yeah, Dell and Nico were very good. And the other note that I had here, even with Damian Pierce back, Devin Singletary outsnapped Damian Pierce 49 to 11 in this game what do you think of texans loss to the jaguars this was a huge afc south game yeah this one really hurt me personally because i was big on the over in this game at 47 and a half yeah too many turnovers too many turnovers the tank dell illegal shift bs and then at the end they had a chance to send it to overtime and get it to the to um 48 maybe 47, I, I I, can't remember. But Matt Amendola uh, hit it off. The, he hit it really hard, the yeah. kicker for the Texans, and it went right off the crossbar. Yeah, It would have gone to overtime, and we would have gotten that that over in, in all likelihood. But yeah. yeah, right off the bar there for sure. That was painful too. I played a uh, – in high-stakes small field, I played a Stroud double 
uh, Stroud, Nico, Tank Dell, and was also rooting for overtime pretty hard. Wouldn't have mattered because I got blown out of the water by all the Josh Allen and Jalen Hurts teams, but yeah. The Texans cannot run the ball at all well outside of C.J. Stroud scrambles, which he looked awesome as a, uh, on the move in this game. I mean, he, he looks awesome in all aspects. And I, I think he's still in the mix for MVP, although that win yeah. would have really, really helped. And the loss, I think, actually hurts kind of a lot. Oh, I think he's he's almost dead now. Yeah. And and Trevor Lawrence is alive now as like a mega long shot. But I, you know, I still think that's that's I think, it, you know, I think that's unlikely. But the Texans running game had been cooking in the previous two games and got nothing going here. You got to have some respect for the Jaguars run defense. It's been great all season, but Singletary was able to come through with six for 54 on seven targets. And I, I expect him to remain the lead, lead back for the Texans the rest of the way. Colts get a good home win here for Gardner Minshew over the Bucks. The big story that broke, I don't know, maybe an hour before we started recording here was that in this game, Jonathan Taylor hurt his thumb. And I thought that something was going on because the gap, I mean, the gap in week 11, I'm sorry, the gap in week 10 before the week 11 by Jonathan Taylor outsnapped Zach Moss 50 to nine. In this game, it was JT 42, Zach Moss 30. The thumb almost certainly had something to do with that, but we'll see. As we're recording this, we do not have any timeline on Jonathan Taylor. All I know is that if Jonathan Taylor is out for a while or any time, Zach Moss is going to crush. I mean, he's just going to crush. So anyways, Evan, we'll have to follow up. When we know more on the JT stuff. What do you think of? Colts win over the Bucks. Yeah, it sounded to me like significant concern that Jonathan Taylor might be out a while. Yeah, but I, I don't want to speculate any more on that. Uh, but that that was just my sense early. Um, Zach Moss is still number ten in the NFL in rushing. He had eight for fifty five on the ground in this one, two for fifteen as a receiver. We got back to Michael Pittman and Josh Downs dominating targets. Mm -hmm. And before Josh Downs started to deal with that knee injury, that is one thing that that had started to emerge, that this is a super uh, narrow target distribution. And, you know, Josh Downs didn't have a big game here, five for 43, but they don't have any other dudes that they throw to. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to let Minshew drop back a good amount. So, um, And they throw these high percentage RPOs at, like, maybe the highest clip in the league. So I think you can count on on, on uh, Josh Downs as like an every week wide receiver three with wide receiver two upside, certainly in, in, in PPR. And he's got more big play ability than Michael Pittman. Agreed. And Michael Pittman is a baller. Like I've, I've probably been too low on Michael Pittman. I mean, he he is very good NFL player. I did not take nearly enough of him in best ball streets this year. Jaguars go on the road to the Texans for that big AFC South game win it they're now two games clear in the afc south so really big win for the jaguars ridley calvin ridley's route tree again looked really good he goes 589 one and he catches a two-point conversion so really good calvin ridley game here thought t law was pretty good as well what do you think of jaguars big win there over the texans yeah the people have been like real pissed about calvin ridley but he's been playing awesome lately and um you know, the the uh, the Jaguars have gone to using a lot more like power, like heavy formations with multiple tight end sets. And I think that this is actually what's helping him is that he's not like, you know, super far out on the sideline anymore in these like tighter formations. And he can use his route running to win like in the middle of the field. And so he's running higher percentage routes. He's a baller, dude. I mean, he... He's one of the best route runners in the league. He put on a clinic. He put Derek Stingley, who was the number three pick in the draft in 2022, in a blender several times in this game. I mean, he's going to be, you know, because of their protection issues, and, I, and multiple tight ends help with the protection issues, and they lost their left tackle in this game, Cam Robinson. He, he had to go on IR. Yeah. So I think they're going to stick with the multiple tight end formations, and I think that's actually good for Calvin Ridley. Only two receivers on the field. Him and Kirk, bad, obviously, for Zay Jones, but that's good for the offense when Zay Jones isn't on the field as much. <laughs> uh, Travis Etienne hurt his chest in this game, uh, came back and played through it for 26 touches, but really struggled for efficiency. We haven't seen Travis Etienne break one of those really big plays in a while. I still think it, it can and will come, but yeah, 26 opportunities for Etienne here, certainly strong. Chiefs. Chiefs got down 
14 nothing in Las Vegas. They storm back and win easily. And they do a lot of it through Rasheed Rice. Now, we talked about this Diana Rossini report on Sunday morning. What the report said was that in the lead up to this game, the Chiefs worked on getting their best players in better positions and working with the young wide receivers on it being more anticipatory. To me, that was like the signal for Rasheed Rice. He's clearly one of their best players on offense, at least the wide receiver position. And he's one of their young wide receivers. So Rasheed Rice didn't blow the doors off in terms of usage. He only ran a route on 68% of the dropbacks, but that was a career high, season high for Rasheed Rice, and he produced in a big way. I mean, I don't see how if the Chiefs want to win the Super Bowl, they can keep this kid off the field anymore. He's got to play even more than 68%, I think. So yeah, what do you think of Chiefs come back in the Rasheed Rice mini breakout here? Well, I thought that after the game, it was interesting in his post-game press conference that Andy Reid was asked about Rasheed Rice and, you know, how does he feel about his development, all that. And Andy Reid said he's becoming more Patrick-friendly, which – and we know how Patrick plays, right? Patrick play, – he loves to do stuff out of structure. You want to – you know, he has to have a good feel for where the pass catcher is moving. The pass catcher has to know what where Patrick likes. I mean, that's why Travis Kelsey has continued to – play at such an extremely high level, even, you know, deep into his career when you're not supposed to be doing that. And Rasheed Rice, if he can continue to do that, he's going to continue to earn more opportunities. I mean, the guy obviously has playmaking ability. McCall, McCall Hardman is on IR now. Kadarius Toney was inactive here with an ankle yeah. and a hip injury, multiple injuries. Jarek McKinnon sat. Their running game has really started to get going. Isaiah Pacheco, I think, has had his best two games of the season – in back-to-back -back games, and I think it was you that noted that with no Jarek McKinnon, Pacheco had a much larger receiving role. Uh, Pacheco, I mean, no McKinnon, and I think they were going to use Kadarius Tony on some of that backfield stuff. He was out too, so no McKinnon, no Pacheco, no Tony. What you get is career high, sixty-eight percent of the routes for Isaiah Pacheco, and saw fifteen percent target share, which is really strong for a running back. Five catches in this game for Pacheco. Really strong. Chargers on Sunday night lost that game to the Ravens. I mean, it's just like every year. They, I feel like the Chargers are so talented every year. They lose so many close games. They have so many injuries. And this is the same story. Quentin Johnston benched in this game. Austin Eckler ankle looks like it remains an issue to me. Obviously, no Big Mike. No Josh Palmer. Maybe Josh Palmer can be back. And by the way, I would see if he's on your waiver wire because they need him badly. But man. The fantasy king in full PPR remained Keenan Allen since Josh Palmer went down and joined Mike Williams. 13.8 targets per game, 36.6% target share, and a 78% catch rate for Keenan Allen. That is absolutely unheard of numbers for Keenan Allen right now. But yeah, it's bad overall, Evan. What do you think of Chargers loss to the Ravens? Yeah, it was a it was a rough one. Um, uh, the only well to expand on Quentin Johnston, like they are now playing Alex Erickson and Jalen Guyton over Quentin Johnston. Yeah, Quentin right. Johnston, like, and I don't want to say that he's a bust, but he's looking like a bust. Very much so. I, I I'm worried about him. The I'm only the him. only wide receivers better than Quentin Johnston in yards per route run right now are Van Jefferson, Allen Robinson. And Terrace Marshall. Those are the guys, the only guys that are worse. I'm sorry. The only guys that are worse than QJ yeah. in, in yards per route run. Van Jefferson, Allen Robinson, Terrace Marshall. I mean. And they tried to attribute Quentin Johnson leaving to a rib injury, but then he got cleared and he never went back in. Like, he was clearly benched. Austin Eckler looks, like, out of gas. Yeah. You know, and that this is becoming a week-over-week -week thing. The ankle, man. I mean, he had yeah. a, a high ankle sprain. Probably came back too soon. And is now not himself. Like yep. that's what it looks like to me. Agree. Let's go. He, he's going to be good in the broadcasting game, though. Oh, he's going to be in the fantasy game. He's going to be doing this podcast. I'm telling you. Like we we could we we might actually be able to hire Austin Eckler. That's how crazy it is. <laughs> the, 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 the sim is so broken. Um, okay, Las Vegas get out to a 14 nothing lead. And somehow, I don't know how they got out to a 14 nothing lead, but they got out to a 14 nothing lead. They end up losing 31-17 to the Chiefs. AOC was fine. Jacobs was good. 
just not enough talent on this team overall. What do you think of Raiders getting out hot and then sputtering out against the Chiefs here? Um, just to add to that, Josh Jacobs on that 63-yard touchdown run just tossed the Chiefs safety, Mike Ed- Ed- Edwards. Um, he's he's balling again. You know, so that's something that you can hang your hat on. They are going into their bye, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, six teams on bye this week. Uh, and then Devontae Adams, the, the Chiefs used Ladarius Sneed in shadow coverage against Devontae Adams. And I would say that Ladarius Sneed won because Devontae Adams was held to five for 73 on seven targets. Yeah. So big, big game from uh, Ladarius Sneed there at the expense of Devontae Adams. I think Antonio Pierce is going to be one of these coaches that, like, even when you're losing, you want to get Josh Jacobs 20 carries. Like, he stated that. And he stated that, yeah. He said it. And even in this game where they were getting killed in the second half, Josh Jacobs still got a bunch of carries, 20 on the nose, 63-yard run, like Evan mentioned. So, yeah. They also got him six targets, yeah. and his targets had been, like, a little bit of an issue since Pierce took over. Dolphins. So this was the Friday game, and this was the Dolphins against Tim Boyle. And we'll get to Tim Boyle in a second here, but Dolphins, relatively easy win. Tyreek and Waddle were both awesome. The game kind of turned on that pick six Hail Mary return before the half, which I'd never seen before. But yeah, easy, predictable win, I think, for the Dolphins here. Evan, what do you think of their Friday, Black Friday performance against the Jets? Got back to the stuff that they were doing last year and whenever Jalen Waddle has been healthy really and that's that the extremely narrow and extremely voluminous target distribution where Mike McDaniel just does not care about getting the ball to anybody else in the passing game and that is good for both Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill um uh nope. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, and then Devin A. Chain, I think, is going to come back this week. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say no Devon A. Chan, no Savan Ahmed. That allowed Jeff Wilson to play 23 snaps, about a third of the snaps, and he got 14 opportunities. I think they'll go back to full A. Chan Mostert uh, going forward. Um, but we'll see. You know, we'll certainly see. Jets. Raheem Mostert. Leads the NFL in rushing touchdowns with 13. He is this year's David Montgomery. Yeah. Jets. So, you know, we talked about last week. There was a reason that the Jets had not gone to Tim Boyle earlier. Now, I think the Jets could have done a ton of other things at quarterback, but Tim Boyle, pretty clearly not it. I'm not even sure that he's better than Zach Wilson. You know, I mean, just, I don't know. Also, in the, well, let's start there, Evan. What do you think of Tim Boyle? Did you think he was better than Zach Wilson or no. any other Tim Boyle thoughts before we get to the rest of the Jets? Stuff? No, 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 no. Yeah, he was horrible for almost the entirety of the game, and he racked up some some stuff in garbage time. But no, he's seven sacks on thirty five dropbacks. Yeah, two picks, two fumbles. No, dude, uh, they I, I I would rather see them play Trevor Simeon. Yeah, me too. And maybe they will, but they've said that they're going to go with Boyle or stick with Boyle here for now. By the way, other Jets notes I had. The healthy scratch Alan Lazard here in favor of guys like Jason Brownlee and Xavier Gibson, who, by the way, were undrafted free agent rookie wide receivers. This is the same Alan Lazard who got $22 million guaranteed just eight months ago, likely in large part because Aaron Rodgers told the Jets to. But, man, Aaron Rodgers, like Lazard, Cobb, Dalvin Cook. I mean, these are the guys that Aaron Rodgers forced on this team, and it's put them in a pretty bad cap situation. The guy who they should just be focusing all their attention on is Garrett Wilson. He's on pace for 99 catches, over 1,000 yards, four and a half touchdowns, with Zach Wilson and Tim Boyle throwing him the football. If Aaron Rodgers had stayed healthy, Garrett Wilson was going to go absolutely nuclear. Oh, last note I had. I don't know if you heard these quotes from... uh, Robert Sala about Brees Hall after the game. Basically, Robert mm-hmm. Hall said, uh, uh, we got to talk to Brees because he's trying to hit too many home runs and not getting what's blocked. Listen, buddy, the only chance you have to score a touchdown on offense is if Brees Hall hits a home run. I don't want to hear that you want Brees Hall to get three yards 
in a cloud of dust. That is completely ridiculous. He should be trying to hit home runs. It's the only way that your team's going to score points. So I don't know if you heard that quote, Evan. Any thoughts on on that and the Brees Hall stuff? I did. I did. Um, Brees Hall is averaging 2.6 yards per carry over his last six games. They have done a decent job of getting him in the passing game. Uh, five catches per game during that span. That's a six-game stretch. That's a lot of catches. But, yeah, I mean, look, he's lost his entire offensive line. He's playing in a backfield with Zach Wilson and Tim Boyle. The offensive environment like literally could not be worse for Brees Hall, and he's trying to make plays. And, I mean, I get it. Yeah. All right. Last thing we're going to do here today is indeed the Tennessee Titans. I thought got a much-needed win for Will Levis confidence here. They had lost three straight. Of course, you know, uh, a narrow home win against the league's worst team, the Panthers, is not that inspiring. But still, uh, a win is a win. I just thought the offense was mad. You know, Levis just 6.6 yards per attempt. Derrick Henry scores twice, but only 76 yards on 18 carries. And like, if Derrick Henry is not going to go nuclear on an efficiency basis in this spot, which was by far the best spot that he's had, all year, I have concerns that there are any big efficiency spots left in Derrick Henry. I don't like to speak ill of the big dog, of course, and he certainly got there in fantasy this past week. But yeah, Evan, what do you think of Titans win over the Panthers? You know, this offense is just, I mean, they have, it's the worst offensive line in the league. They got a rookie quarterback who's, you know, somewhat promising, but in a bad situation. They can't trust really any of their pass catchers other than DeAndre Hopkins. And yeah, I mean, look, if Derek, I mean, if Derek Henry, you know, has, has reached the point, it's just, it's not an, it's not an interesting offense. It was just a, a pretty good spot oh. for Derek Henry. And I don't know, we'll, we'll see, but I, I don't really anticipate being super aggressive on him the rest of the way. I mean, it's just the offensive environment. Again, we talk about the jets and the Titans back to back, like, Let's let's end the show. <laughs> and also, the Titans probably have the league's worst offensive line too. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's just bad all around. All right, that is going to do it for this team by team ahead of Week 13. Appreciate you all. Appreciate you all being here. If you're watching this on YouTube, do us a big favor and hit the subscribe button. You will know when we post new videos as we get towards the end of the season. Here, reminder that we will have a ton of content through the off season as well. So be sure you are indeed subscribed for Evan, for producer Luke, for producer Ryan. I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.